was wonderful to see everyone here this morning. Thank you for those songs. I love the choice of songs that you, you all pick. Turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to be looking at verses 17 through 19 this morning. Do have a Bible open in front of you if you can. Should be one in front of you in a pocket, hopefully. Philippians 3. Beginning with uh, verse 17, we'll pray and then begin. Brothers, join in imitating me, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many, of whom I have often told you, and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Thank you for a beautiful day to come together and to worship you. We do thank you for the beauty of creation, the snow. Thank you for the, the changing climate that we experience. Father, as we look into your word, I pray that you'll open all of our eyes to this, this text, these truths. Help us, Father, to see how it applies to us. Help us to understand that this, your word is, is speaking to us and directing us and, and guiding us, warning us in this passage we're looking at today. Help us to be very careful about those we allow to teach us your truths. Help us to have a hawk's eye to carefully discern the teaching and whether it's biblical or whether it's not. Help us to understand, Father, the seriousness of this, that uh, we have examples to follow in Scripture. We have examples like Paul and other people, and we have other people to avoid. Help us to be very discerning in that area, Father. We thank you for your word that you've given to us that like the Bereans, we can search through it and we can know whether something is from you or not. But Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the clarity of your word. Help all of us be warned this morning as we're looking at this passage and to be assured. Thank you, Father, for the, for the wonderful things that you've done in people's lives, how you've worked through them. And those lives are on display in front of us sometimes through biographies, through other means. And Father, we thank you for that. Help us, Father, to imitate those that we should and avoid those that we should. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, one of the most famous missionaries to China in the late 19th century, early 20th century was Dr. David Duncan Maine. No, I had never heard of him before. I ran across him because a Chinese man told him once that his name, interpreted in Chinese loosely, is Dr. Apricot of Heaven Below. Dr. Apricot of Heaven Below. And I'm, I'm looking at that, thinking about our, our, our passage here. As we get down into it, our citizenship is in heaven. That's how I ran into him, and I thought, how in the world do you arrive at... at Dr. Apricot of Heaven Below from his name. He was from Hangzhou, if I'm saying that right, a city nicknamed Heaven Below because of its beauty, because of the prosperity there in that city. But Dr. Apricot of Heaven Below, it's catchy, isn't it? Just, uh, there's actually three biographies, I believe, written on him, and they all include that in the, in the title. But verse 20, if you look at it there, which we're going to look at next week, Lord willing, speaks of our citizenship presently, right now, as Christians. It speaks of our citizenship as being in heaven. We are people of two spheres, aren't we? Heaven above and heaven below. We are already seated with Christ, Scripture tells us, in the heavenlies, yet living here in a dark world. A world that is overrun with sin. Yet, as we just saw in Philippians, we are to be shining like lights in this world. Chapter 2 told us that we are to be shining like lights in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. Citizens of heaven, above and below. 
Every believer should bring heaven down to the dark world they're living in in some way. A large portion of our text, if you look at it there, speaks about, both in a positive way and a negative way, about how we should live. Verse 17, imitating the Apostle Paul and others who are following after Christ. And verses 18 and 19, being wary of, avoiding, not imitating the many spoken of in those verses who are enemies of the cross, whose God is their belly, whose glory is their shame, whose minds are set on earthly things. A citizen of heaven should live and follow heavenly ways while here. Once, several years ago, Joe Vest, our missionary to India, who is from India, invited Melissa and I over to his house. Uh, to, he said, uh, I want to invite you over to have an authentic Indian meal and to eat it in an authentic Indian way. Uh, we went over there and sat down and he started eating with his fingers. And he didn't serve us fried chicken or corn on the dogs with a stick or anything. You know, it was a sauce and a vegetable and rice, so it was pretty messy. We, did, we didn't last too long. We tried it for a few minutes. And, and I thought, how awkward for Joe Vest to come over here to the United States and to use utensils, you know. When he's here alone, he's eating with his fingers. He's doing, he's following his homeland ways even when he's away from it. The citizen of heaven, in the same way, should follow heavenly ways while we're here. I began reading about uh, Dr. Apricot of Heaven Below, and I thought, wow, he, he serves as an illustration, as an illustration in more than, more than one way. Not just his name reminding us of our, our citizenship, but also the way he lived, the life that he lived. Listen, listen to, to the life he lived. He could have lived a very comfortable life in Britain, Scotland, where he was from. He had a, a, a medical degree he earned and two business degrees. He was very, evidently very bright and started very young because he, he served he, he went to China in his, in his 20s, in his mid to early 20s. There was a point, though, after he had earned those degrees and when he was living in Britain, Scotland, that he was commandeered by Christ. As we saw last time we were together looking at this, he, like Paul, sat in the, the passenger seat as Christ commandeered his life, and he said, let's go. He was going after what Christ was going after with just as much gusto as, as Christ was. Using the language of Philippians 3.12 that we looked at previously, he pressed on pursuing, trying to grasp that purpose for which Christ Jesus grasped him. It's interesting, isn't it? Kind of, kind of confusing language, but it, but it makes perfect sense. Christ Jesus took hold of Paul. He took hold of this Dr. Main, and they were excited to go where he wanted them to go. Apprehended Dr. Main at an early age, drafted, called up to service in, in China, to serve a country that was in major upheavals in so many ways. They had, they had opium addiction that was tearing the country apart. Major political divisions were brewing. Leprosy, tuberculosis were rampant. And so he poured himself out as a representative of Christ. 45 years of service in China. This is one of the things I like about Christian biographies. They spur me on. They, they slap me in the face and they say, come on, get with it, Troy. 45 years of service, created a hospital from the ground up, one of the largest hospitals in that province yet today, treating 20 inpatients, 200 outpatients per month, providing medical training for Chinese men and women, hundreds of them, graduating them after four years of school, a separate woman's hospital created, and then another woman's hospital dedicated to obstetrics, a leprosorium, a tuberculosis hospital, founded some 30 medical and welfare institutions, translated many medical books into Chinese. When he decided that he was going to retire, or, or he saw the retire, his retirement on the horizon, he began writing letters daily of everything he did so that the transition would be smooth when he handed it over. When he saw that, that finish line coming closer, he wrote to the, the leaders in China requesting $50,000 to buy more equipment to get them situated. He wrote this, I don't want to die yet. And I think I'm good for 10 more years of hard work. And by that time, I, ha I hope Western medicine in China will really have taken root and it'll be easy for me to retire. Interesting, isn't it? He was honored by China, given the title Mandarin Fifth Class. 
I tried to look that up to see exactly what that meant, but all I could find was Mandarin Chinese, uh, lessons and if, in class five and all that. So, but anyway, he was he was not labeled as a foreign devil, as many were, but he was given an honorary title. Like Paul, as we remember where we were in the last couple of weeks, he pressed on, he pursued the goal to serve Christ, to fellowship with Christ in service and in suffering, not looking back, but pressing on toward the goal. 17, look at it again. It says, keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Dr. Main qualifies, doesn't he? Keep your eyes on people like that and imitate them. Paul says in our, in our text here today, imitate me. Imitate me and people who walk according to my example. Now think about that. Each of us in our own unique and individual way can imitate him. We're not all called to be a, an apostle to the Gentiles. We're not all call, called or qualified to be medical missionaries. But we are all to imitate him, these godly men. To have a single focus, that's Christ. To know Him, to serve Him, to press on, to, again, own what Christ made you His own for. Paul was called into service, wasn't he? God had a specific call on his life. You remember when he talked to him in the very beginning, he, he said, you're going to suffer many things. I have, I have to show you what you, I have in store for you. God has something specific in store for you. Good works, right, that He has prepared beforehand for you to walk in. It's going to be fleshed out differently for every one of us. We are to shine like lights in the darkness. We are to glorify God in this world. And it's going to be unique and different for every one of us how we do that. But at the core, there are going to be some similarities. And we looked at them. We saw them over the last couple of weeks we were here. A deepening relationship with Christ. An ever-increasing holiness, purity of life. A focus on serving and loving others, if you go back far enough here. A faith that is centered on the gospel, an alien righteousness that comes from God and that makes a difference in our life, that changes us. But how we serve in the world, it's going to be wonderfully unique for every one of us, isn't it? Just looking at verses 17 through 19 today, we're going to see some we are to imitate, verse 17, and some we are to avoid. Read verse 17 with me again. 317, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. I told Melissa earlier in the week when I started studying this, I wanted to do 17 through 21 together. It is a whole picture. It is a complete picture. In verses 17 through 19, we have an exhortation on how we should live down here, who we should follow, who we shouldn't follow, dangers and pitfalls and snares to avoid down here. And then if you look at it in verses 20 and 21, that deals with a happier time. <laughs> a safer time, a time when the dangers and the snares are not there. All that is in the past. Our lowly bodies are going to be transformed. Everything's going to be new. I thought it would be wonderful to take both of them together, but there's so much in verses 17 and 18, and then there's so much in verses 19 or 20 and 21. So we're going to deal with it separately. But notice that 17 through 19 deal with the here and now. A time when opportunity to do this, to serve, to, to suffer for Christ, as Paul even said there. I, I, Paul says, I want everything that He wants for me. Isn't that amazing to think of the, the sovereignty and the providential care of God? And Paul is here saying, if He has suffering planned for me, which He does because He told me early on, <laughs> I want that. I want everything that He has for me because He loves me and He cares for me and He's doing the best for me. And He's going to make everything turn out for the good and for His glory. But there is a time now, think about this, where all of these opportunities exist, and that's, and that's now. We have the opportunity to fully serve Him, to take the gospel to a, to a needy world, and, 
if you look at it in time frames, the difference between 17 and 18 and 19 and then 20 and 21, the time is short in between there, isn't it? The time is very short. Our opportunity window is open now and it won't be open forever. It's going to come a time when we're going to stand before Christ at the end and we're going to be rewarded for our service, right? Or we're going to or we're going to be shown what we could have done and what we didn't do. Being honored with a title like Mandarin fifth class, even from such a noble country as China, is nothing compared to standing before Christ, our Lord, our Savior, and hearing, well done, you did well. Our time is short. Are we using the time? Paul begins by using the word brothers. See it there? Well, ladies, you're not, you're not shorted. You're not slighted there. The Greek could easily, just as easily be brothers and sisters, fellow Christians. It includes all believers. But it is a, it's a term of affection. Uh, there, there's an <clears throat> increased emotion here when he begins verse 17. There's a deep pastoral concern that, that we're, we're feeling when he says that. And he's calling them to something that's very serious. And, and what is that? Imitate me, he says. <laughs> I've had people come to me before and say, well, that, this just seems, this seems very, very proud. It seems very egotistical for Paul to say, brothers, imitate me. You must think very highly of yourself, don't you, Paul? <laughs> Remember something. Think about this. The people in the early church, the people there in Philippi did not have did not have the completed New Testament canon. They had very few books of the, of the canon of the New Testament. And can you imagine living in that time and trying to live as a Christian in the very beginning with, without all those letters of guidance, with, without all that helpful direction that we have, without having centuries of theologians debating over and centuries of pastors preaching these letters and these books. We have so much direction that they did not have then. So the role of the apostles was so important. They were, they were laying the foundations of the church, its teachings and its, its doctrines. So it was very helpful for the, for the people there to have before them a, a living example. Of what we should do, how we should do it, how we should react. So you can imagine them all just thinking when everything came up. They couldn't go to their Bibles and quote verses to one another, but they could say, well, how would Paul have handled this? How did he respond when something like this happened? His, his living example was a, a blessing for them. Flip, flip a couple pages to the right and look at 1 Thessalonians. It's three pages to the right or so, my Bible at least. He says something very similar here. 1 Thessalonians 1, 6 and 7. And this is kind of, kind of shocking in a sense, kind of surprising in a sense. Verse 7. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. Just right there. But just think about that. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction with joy, with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Phillips translation. You set yourselves to copy us. And indeed... The Lord Himself. <laughs> that, that should be arresting. Is that the word I was looking for? A word that kind of just... Wait. How incredible would it be to be able to say, when you're imitating me, you're imitating the Lord. <laughs> well, that's... First of all, it makes, me, it makes me think. I need to be very careful about how I live my life. Imitating Paul. Also, it says, they became people who should be imitated. People who could be imitated. Are we living a life, and we need, to, we need to think about this, are we living our life in such a way that to imitate us is to imitate Christ? <laughs> are we living our life in such a way that to imitate us is, is a good example and, and one to copy and one to follow? Remember, as I said a couple times now while we're in this area in Philippians God's number one goal for His children is for us to become more like our older brother, Christ. 
transforming us. He's working. His Holy Spirit is working, transforming us into the image of His Son. Christ-likeness is the goal. We are to be living illustrations of Jesus. Not perfect, as Paul's already said, but being perfected. And seeing an increase in holiness. Seeing a life more devoted to Him. So as we walk closer with Christ, abiding in Him, we take on or, or the Spirit forms in us the, the graces of Christ. And we should all be able to say with Paul right here, follow my example, imitate me. Are we doing that? Are we following Him, imitating Him? And are we able to say that to others? It's amazing to think that other people can catch a glimpse of Christ in us. I wonder how much of Stephen's death and the persecution that Stephen experienced with Paul being the one standing there responsible for it, watching it happen, how much that affected Paul, watching the example of Stephen. You remember when Stephen was, was martyred, when he was stoned to death, that at one point he stood up and said, I see the Lord. You know? and, and then the next thing he says, he prays for those who are throwing stones at him. A, a perfect example of what Christ did, praying for the soldiers who were nailing him to the cross. And here Paul is the one responsible. He's watching this happen. And then what does is, what is Jesus say to him later? We have early on in Acts the, the story of his conversion, Jesus saying, why do you persecute me? But in Acts 26, we have something added that Christ said that wasn't there. Why do you kick against the goads? Some things, some things have been poking at you, Paul. And instead of going in the direction you should go, you're, you're kicking at that. And, and it makes me think that that was him thinking, thinking, about the godly example laid down by Stephen. He had a godly example in front of him, and it was goading him, prodding him. Look at the words there in verse 17. Keep your eyes on, or observe, another translation, take note of, another one, watch carefully. The Greek means to fix your gaze on them. I, I see here, first time I read it, I, I, I see uh, uh, an endorsement for Christian biographies. <laughs> to read Christian biographies. To set our eyes. To fix our gaze on those people. Study their lives. See how they handled situations. We have a, what, what a blessing it is to have, from the beginning to the end, story of this person's life. We can see their failures. We can see their weaknesses. But we can also see what God has done the powerful things that He's done in their lives. That should spur us on to be who we can be. You know, David, David Maine, Dr. David Duncan Maine was a workhorse. <laughs> he accomplished so much. Over the last two weeks we've been studying, the men have been studying on Wednesday nights or the last three weeks, whatever, how uh, don't waste your life with John Piper and specifically uh, these last couple weeks on, on our vocation, how we can glorify God and not waste our life in our chosen vocation. A lot of us think that, well, when you hear a life like Dr. Maine or, or Paul, and you think, well, I need to stop what I'm doing. I need to join some sort of a ministry somewhere. But Paul said, no. He said, my, my general rule for telling people as he's planting these churches is stay where you are. And then he said, with God. With God. You're not who you were. You're a believer now. You may be in any kind of a job you can think of, but are you there with God? Is God there with you, making a difference in how you do your work? Our work should adorn the gospel. It should make it attractive. So keep your eyes on men like that, women like that. A lot of wonderful, Mary Slesser, and, uh, oh, I can't think of her name now, India, Carmichael, Amy Carmichael, wonderful missionary stories that we could be reading and studying. There are people to imitate, and then there are people to avoid. Look at verses 18 and 19. He says, For many 
of whom I have often told you, and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. So some by their lives, by their example, spur us on to godliness, and others can cause us to stumble. And we are to avoid these people. Look at that. Paul points to many, doesn't he? There are many examples of this type. Like, like the road of destruction is broad, and many are there who are traveling that road. So there are many examples of dangerous teachers, ferocious wolves, ravenous wolves, as Jesus called them. T turn back to Matthew with me. And look at Matthew 7. Matthew 7, verses 15 through 20. Jesus, talking about false prophets, false teachers. Matthew 7, 15 through 20. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Look at what Jesus says there. He says, beware. He warns us. There's deceptiveness here. This is sneaky. The wolves are actually disguised as sheep. They look like sheep. <laughs> it's easy to be deceived. This is, this is Satan's number one strategy, isn't it? Deception and false religion and twisted teaching. Those are his specialties, right? He started with it in the garden. You go into a public library, you go into a Christian bookstore, and you'll learn that many, many of those books are not a true representation of what the Bible teaches. I remember early on when I started buying books, I had a, a guy tell me, an old, he wasn't older, he was a little bit younger than me, but he, he'd been in the ministry for a while, and he said, interesting, you've got kind of a, a what do you call it, a mixture here. You've got some of this, this mindset and some of this mindset. And it's like, well, this guy's really quotable. He's got a lot of really good things to say. But, you know, if you've got these two people in a room, they'd probably be talking about their differences because they're that stark. They're that different. And, and when you think about it, I used, to, I used to read William Barclay. Everyone reads William Barclay because he's good on history. But as you start studying through his commentaries, he's discounting or he's, he's trying to give a human, uh, uh, natural explanation for every miracle in there because he doesn't believe in miracles. He doesn't believe in the virgin birth. And so it's like after a while you're thinking, he's good on history, but he's really bad on theology, so maybe I shouldn't be using him. Because <laughs> he may be, may be drawing me into an area and, and me not really understand it. We need to be very, very careful about who we, who we are allowing to teach us theology. These are the, the religious teachers. Think about it. Spurgeon had his that he contended with in his day. M Machen traveled the country by, by rail uh, debating because there was such a stark difference in the teachings on religion, on faith. People like MacArthur. People spend a, a fair amount of time pointing out the dangers. And what do people do? Well, he's, he's striking at the unity of the church. And he shouldn't be doing that. And that's not what we're seeing Paul say right here. Before we sit at the feet of just any teacher, we need to do our best to check them out, to see what others point out about them, to be Bereans, to take our Scripture and start studying exactly what they're saying, compare their teaching with Scripture, but also realize the deceptiveness, that it's significant, as Jesus said, as Paul says. It may not be easily discernible. We may be being duped right now. <laughs> we need to see what... Sometimes we have trusted others. We have other people that we trust, and it's good to listen. Okay, what do they say about this person? And then go check it out for yourself and see if, in fact, that's the case. 
I have a couple of coil. I had a couple of coil that succumbed to the cold, uh, died in the freezing, freezing weather. And I, you probably think this is horrible. I'm sorry, animal rights people might have a fit here, but they were frozen solid, of course, as soon as they died. So I set them aside there by the cage. And, and after a couple of days, I thought, well, I've got a red-shouldered hawk down in the woods that is just, they're, they're extremely vocal. So you know they're there when it's a red-shouldered hawk is just constantly making its noise and beautiful bird. And I thought, well, I'll feed that hawk. So I took them down there and I set them in the snow and they looked like perfect quail setting in the snow. I thought I've got him in a place where the snow's not messed up and I'll be able to see what happens, you know, if, a, if he comes, if a hawk comes down and gets him or, or whatever. But then after a couple days, nothing happened. And I thought, they look perfect sitting there in the snow. Why haven't they been eaten? How good is a hawk's vision anyway? So I, I looked it up. It's, it's interesting. I, I found an eagle can't be a, a whole lot different. Um, an, an eagle can see an ant on the ground from the top of a 10-story building. That's amazing, isn't it? Not, not only that, it, it could see it in brilliant color, unlike us, a different, a totally different view of things, see it in UV vision, and not only that, uh, almost a 360 degree range of view. I thought, isn't that amazing? I mean, God has made these animals, specifically birds of prey, with such clarity of vision. So, uh, so, yeah, there's no problem. That hawk is going to be able to see that quail and understand what it is from a distance away. But I, but I thought we need to have a clarity of vision as we're, as we're putting ourselves under the teaching of certain people. Nowadays with the internet, with the radio, with all that, with the TV, we can turn it on and we need to realize a lot of those people are dangerous and we need to avoid them. Many of them are good, too. But there are many who are not. We need to be very discerning and be able to see things clearly. Look at our passage again there. Paul, look at this, often warned about these people. So here we have an, an apostle telling us, uh, and a, a foundation layer of the church telling us, I often warned people about this. So it's not wrong for me to spend an inordinate amount of time this morning on this. This is something we really need to be warned about and often we need to be careful about shaking our heads at, at Christian teachers who point out false teaching. They are following Christ's example. They're following Paul's example. They have scriptural warrant for what they do. Some of them, though, do it with glee, don't they? <laughs> they seem to live for pointing out the errors in others. And that's not at all what Paul's doing here. If you look at him, what he says, he says, And now I tell you, even with tears about this, Oh, he's not doing it gleefully. He's, he's not making this his job, you know, to sit on the internet and point out the errors of, of others. He's doing it with tears. I think this is the only place in Scripture where Paul says, as I write, I'm crying. As I write, I'm, I'm tearing up. Paul was warning them, probably about the, the Judaizers. We had talked about the, the Jewish Christians, Jews who had become Christian, who then thought... It's not enough to just trust and believe in Jesus. You also have to obey in order to be saved. You have to follow the law. You have to be circumcised. You have to merge your obedience with faith in Christ in order to be saved. And what they taught struck at the core of Christianity, the, of, of, the, of, the, of the gospel, which is the cross. They, they taught what they taught that it is not sufficient. The cross is, is not sufficient. The death of Christ is not enough. You have to add something to it in order to be saved. Now think about this. This is not saying works have no place in, in the Christian life. Oh, do they? God has saved us for that purpose. We glorify God by the things we do. Our works reveal to us what's going on in our life. They play a big role. They reveal what's, what's going on inside. Jesus in, in Matthew 7.15 went on to say, you'll recognize false teachers by their works. So if our lives clearly reveal that we are slaves to sin, that a sinful habit is just running wild in our life, that might and probably does reveal that there's, there's a problem. You might not be saved. However, no Christian is perfect, are they? I had a pastor tell me once, 
you know, talking to him about uh, Mark failing, who was here, talking to him about my, my, my uh, temptations and things like that. And I said, but I should be past this. I should be on to the next one to attack. And he said, we usually struggle with the same temptations throughout our Christian walk. But we, we begin to master it instead of being mastered by it. Our works do not save us. They do not keep us saved. But they do, they do reveal what's going on inside. If you look at verse 8 and 19, we're not done with 18 yet, but look at 19. It gives us a further description of the wolves in sheep's clothing. Their God is their belly. <laughs> Meaning their sensual appetites. They glory in their shame. What they should be ashamed of, they're proud of. Their minds are set on earthly things. So he's not talking about a Christian leader here who is struggling with sin, struggling with a temptation. Uh, a leader who is battling sin and, and is being defeated sometimes, but he's struggling and he's fighting against it. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying these guys have their minds set on earthly things. Their, 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 their God is their sensual appetite, and they are using people for that. The big, big difference. Wolves, false teachers, often, if you think about it, attack the cross. They, they walk, as Paul says there, as enemies of the cross. The cross is the, the touchstone of Christianity, of, of our faith. See what that teacher says about the cross. See what he says about what did the cross accomplish? Did it satisfy God's wrath for you? See if they de-emphasize the cross. Many do. There's a new TV show. I shouldn't even be saying this. A movie called His Only Son. And I've not seen it, so I don't know. But the little caption underneath it says, uh, talking about the, uh, the most, one of the most controversial passages in the Old Testament where Abraham took his son up to offering. And for today, in the church, that is very controversial. There are many people saying the idea of Christ dying on the cross and God sending him there, that's child abuse. And they have no place for the cross, no place for the atonement. And it goes back to the picture that we see with Abraham there offering his son the same thing. But today in the church, this is a major area where many people are, are attacking the cross and saying that has nothing to do with us. We are to live good lives. <laughs> We're to bless those around us. So what do, what do those teachers that we're following, what do they really say about the cross? Do they emphasize it as they should? Do they say, as Paul says, but far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. He was all about the cross, wasn't he? Remember the book of Romans. He begins that treatise, that incredible book of Romans, saying, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And at the center of the gospel is the cross, right? So false teachers often will attack or walk as enemies of the cross. And we are to avoid those who have an unbiblical view of the cross and an unbiblical emphasis of the cross. Because, as he says there, their end is destruction. The Phillips says they are heading for utter destruction. The TEV, they are going to end up in hell. And they'll take many with them. That's why Jesus said they're ravenous wolves. Destructive. And he says, here, here, here's a way to identify them, Paul does. Their God is their belly. They glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. As I said, Paul was probably writing about the, the Judaizers, maybe, maybe uh, the early forms of Gnosticism that were coming into the church. But his words apply across the, across the board. All false teachings, all cults. And if you think about it, cults, cults seem to really end up here most often, don't they? with the leaders of those cults abusing, uh, sexually abusing, taking advantage of children and women. Jude warns in his letter, he says, those who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality, 
looking at grace as, as so freely given by God that it does not matter at all what I do. And that would be right in with Gnosticism. He says, Jude, they follow their own sinful desires. We don't need to go through the, the names. We don't need to go through the list of pastors. We don't need to muddy our minds with the horrible things that have been done. But we all know that so often people who are, who are leading a cult, leading a false teaching, end up in this area. And you know what? We don't see it until later. We don't find out about it until later. We hear that for a long time now, this has been going on in this person's life and abusing the people in his church. Their God is their, their belly. There are those whose God is their sensual appetites, and they are proud in their own minds, and even boastfully sometimes, of what they should be ashamed of. They are not, as we go back and look at what Paul's been saying, they are not selfless. All the way back to chapter 2. They are not selfless. They are selfish. They are not living in self-denying devotion to God. Love and, and serving, loving and serving others. No, their focus is here. Their focus is down here. On themselves and things down here. Paul says, set your mind. In another place, he says, set your mind on things above. And these people have their minds on things down here. When the focus of the sermon is down here, <laughs> that's a problem. I, I watched a Joel Osteen sermon where he was preaching. It's, I think it's the only one I've ever watched on, on the book of Ruth. I was uh, looking for something. This has been years ago, and I thought, I heard him say something about Ruth, and I thought, I love the book of Ruth. What's he, what's he going to do with this? And, I, and it was horrible. The whole thing was interweaved with him and his wife wanting to buy a property next to them. And, and, and the struggle of being able to get that property and to buy it in order to provide a cushion between them and other neighbors. And all through this sermon, he kept bringing that up. I thought, your focus is wrong. <laughs> all wrong. Well, you tear up and destroy a beautiful book like Ruth by making it about something now here that, that I can have and possess. It's interesting to think about this. One of, one of the fastest growing religious movements, one of the largest Christian movements is the health, wealth, and prosperity movement, also called Word of Faith, where there is an obvious focus on earthly things, on what I can get. If you're hearing an emphasis on positive thinking, on speaking the right words, on not speaking the wrong words, uh, negative thinking, if focusing on desired outcomes, speaking words of faith, those are all catchphrases and they're more than a red flag. They're, they're a warning siren going off. <laughs> this, is not, this is not biblical at all. These, these teachers are altogether different from, from Paul, whose focus was Christ whose mind was so set on heavenly things, he said, it's my desire to depart <laughs> and go and be with Him. Notice, again, they walk as enemies of the cross. For Christ, what did the cross signify? A laying down of Himself for others. Not self-indulgence, not self-gratification, but exactly the opposite of that. He laid down his life for us. And we need to ask ourselves, as we look at a passage like this, what are we living for? <laughs> what, what is our goals and our hopes and our desires? Is it all down here? That's, that's, a, that's a, a signal to us, isn't it? Who do we find ourselves admiring? Who do we find ourselves wanting to emulate, wanting to dress like and look like? Who are we patterning ourselves after? You know, I, I thought it's, it's interesting. God started the uh, New Testament with four accounts of the life of Christ. Four Christian biographies to the max, right? <laughs> this is who we're supposed to be focusing on. This is who we're sp supposed to be imitating, who we're supposed to be emulating and wanting to be like. He is our example our primary example, but he's also so much more than that, isn't he? The cross, his death on the cross, brings us peace with God. Look at what Paul said, and we'll close with this. Chapter 3, verses 8 through 11. 
potent part of this whole passage, this whole chapter. He says, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For His sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and may share His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for, first of all, the example of Paul, the example of Dr. Main, the so many people's lives that You have commandeered and You have called into service and empowered them for it given them the will and the, the desire and the power to do those things. We thank You, Father, for those lives, and I pray that each of us will desire to see that for our own life. Not that we'll run off into missions or anything like that, but that we'll be where we are with You, and that will make a huge difference. We thank You, Father, for Your love for us, for Your transforming work in each of us and I pray that you help us to, to work along with you on that to yield to your work in our life in such an active way I thank you for your love for us Father thank you for what you can do through your people and I pray Father that each of us will have that as our prayer that we will be so used of you that we will honor you and glorify you it's in Jesus name we pray Amen.